Thanks for having me, everyone. Um, today I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Kulin Nations in Melbourne, on which I live and work. Um, and I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of these lands, the people of the Woiwurrung language group, and their continuing connection to land, to waters and to culture. I pay my respects to the elders of the Kulin Nations, past, present and emerging, and I extend this respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today. So today I'm going to talk to you about modelling ice sheet deformation with a real focus on um, larger scales, so basin to continental scale um, domains using the E-star flow relation. So we know from um, satellite records that glaciers in Antarctica have been accelerating in recent decades and having continuous records of um, ice surface velocity have been a real game changer in our ability to understand mass balance from Antarctica and Greenland. We've seen that mass loss has been increasing. Um, so using the input output method, um, mass loss averaged over the period 2007 to 2019 was a factor of six greater than the 79 to 90 average. And especially in Antarctica, where mass loss isn't driven by changes in the surface mass balance um, like it is in Greenland, these data also really help us to estimate not just um, mass loss um, as a result of discharge of the grounding line, but also to investigate um, some of the dynamic processes that are driving that mass loss. But if we're considering the processes by which ice flows, um, and particularly if we want to understand how ice flow is going to change as the climate warms, then we need to consider not just the surface expression of um, speed, but what's going on beneath the surface as well. And that's where this work comes in. So one of the key questions that my modelling um, is, is well, one, of the, one of the key motivations um, of the work today is really to understand more about the processes of ice flow, of deformation and sliding, and um, with the aim to improve how we model deformation at that basin to continental scale. <clears throat> and so um, I'm looking at a couple of questions in the, in the talk today. Um, and, and they are, where is ice flowing by deformation? And, and where is it flowing by sliding? And what's the impact of um, the choice of flow relation that we use in models um, when it includes different types of processes that are important to deformation on the relative contributions of deformation and, and sliding? Um, and knowing these answers to, to these kinds of questions is going to be really important as we consider questions about instabilities and um, rapid retreat in, in the changing climate. So, we know that ice flows by a combination of deformation and sliding um, uh, in response to gravitational driving in the direction of steepest surface slope. So deformation um, is loosely defined as the movement within and between ice crystals, um, deforming, the stretching, the shearing that goes on at the crystal level. And this figure here um, represents, um, the, I guess, the main component of ice deformation, which is the bed parallel vertical shear deformation. Um, which you can see in this profile here. And that's generally the dominant type of deformation operating in ice sheets and glaciers. Um, typically we see the ice uh, frozen to the bed or um, you know, quite cool, and then deformation increases as you move vertically upwards through that profile. Although um, usually we have the region of greater single shear somewhere close to the base. And we, and we know that from, from um, observations in the field. And then we also have sliding, which is another process by which ice flows, and that's represented um, to the left of the, of the deformation profile here in the presence of liquid meltwater. Um, we get the bulk movement of ice. Uh, it also occurs when we have a deformable till um, at the face. So I mentioned on the previous slide that um, bed parallel vertical shear deformation is important. But there are, of course, other components of, of um, deformation <clears throat> that operate. And so, for example, if we're in an embayed ice shelf or um, an ice stream, then we'll, we'll see top, topographic interactions at the side walls, um, inciting lateral drag, so that you get a similar profile to that um, bed parallel vertical shear profile, but oriented differently. And then we also have longitudinal stresses, so compression and extension. And, um, uh, the combination of, of these kinds of stresses that, that um, act horizontally, although I use that term very loosely, it's not actually horizontal, um, 
uh, sometimes called membrane stresses, and, and that's how I refer to them today. So where does ice flow by deformation and where does it flow by sliding? Well, we expect deformation to be dominant, um, or the dominant contributor to the overall surface speed in regions where the ice is frozen to the bed, um, or, or where, um, where we expect to see bed parallel vertical shear deformation. And um, you know, for that, that's represented, I guess, if, if you look at the figure on the left, um, which, it, which is a, an estimate of the basal temperatures, um, indicating where the ice may be thawed and where it might be frozen in Antarctica from Patin 2010, then the areas that are represented in blue might be um, uh, key areas to look at if, if we want to find where ice is flowing by deformation. A caveat here, of course, so this is an estimate of the basal temperatures from an ice sheet model. A caveat, of course, is that um, estimating where the ice is frozen to the bed and where it's thawed can be a function of the flow relation, particularly through the temperature dependent flow parameter. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, elsewhere on the ground at ice sheet, and particularly where the ice is flowing faster, so where we are generating frictional heating and um, melt, uh, liquid melt water, um, or where the geothermal heat flow is large, so in large parts of West Antarctica, we would expect sliding to be um, the dominant contributor to ice flow. So again, we can we might be able to determine what these regions are or, or have a bit of an indication of, of um, these regions by looking at basal temperatures. Um, we can also use estimates from geophysics of fields like um, where there's liquid meltwater present, say from radar constraints, to, uh, to indicate um, where, yeah, where we might be interested in looking to see where ice is flowing predominantly by sliding or deformation. Deformation is also really important on the ice shelves. Um, and particularly where we see those membrane stresses operating, so stretching as we move towards the ice ocean front. Okay, so deformation is important in large parts of Antarctica, but how do we model it? And the answer to that, of course, is um, depends on your model and your question, and um, I'm really focusing again on the larger scale um, aspect of ice sheet modeling here. So we model deformation using flow relations, and um, flow relations really capture the response of the ice sheet to an applied stress, uh, simple shear, compression, or some combination of the two of those stresses. And they're most commonly derived from laboratory experiments. So let's imagine that you're in the ice mechanics laboratory, you've got a block of polycrystalline ice and it's isotropic, so it has no preferred crystal orientation. And that's um, kind of represented by these figures up here on the left which I uh, took from Croydon 2021. Um, so you see here that there's no preferred crystal orientation, of, there's no preferred orientation of the, of the crystals here and, and the ice is uh, kind of randomly, has randomly oriented crystals. And then we apply a constant stress, either simple shear or compression or extension or some combination of those. And we hold all the other conditions constant. And what we see is the ice initially undergoes um, this stage of primary creep and the strain rate decreases over time and it, until it reaches um, minimum strain rate um, at, a, at a stage of creep we call secondary creep. And after that, we see increasing strain rates over time until we reach, an, an, um, until we reach a, a, a period of steady state or tertiary creep phase. And from secondary creep, um, so at secondary creep, the ice is still isotropic. But from that period through to the tertiary creep phase, we see the development of a preferred crystal orientation fabric, and that's represented by these figures here. Um, now, in tertiary creep, we also see that, um, so those crystal orientation fabrics um, evolve to reflect the accumulating strain history in the flow. And so the, the fabrics are compatible. We can, we can assume that the fabrics are compatible with their, their um, strain history because the the time scales of which those fabrics develop are relatively short compared to the, um, um, the, the time scale of, of deformation. And if we think about what's going on in a real glacier then, um, because obviously this is a laboratory experiment where we're holding the stress constant, we can also assume that um, even when ice is encountering changing stress regimes, um, that if, um, uh, if, the timescales over which the fabrics develop are short compared to the timescales over which those 
um, stress regime, regimes change, we can also assume that fabrics in uh, real ice sheet or glacier are compatible with the current stress configuration. And that's a key assumption that we're going to rely on for the development of the E-star flow relation. We also um, know that uh, tertiary, the tertiary creep phase is the predominant mode of deformation in glaciers and ice sheets. Um, uh, although there are regions where that assumption falls down and I'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. Now here, another thing that we see in this um, cartoon is that the magnitude of the strain rates at tertiary creep or at steady state is a function of the type of stress applied. And um, uh, for simple shear, we know that the, the, the final strain rates are much larger than what they are for ice that's undergoing um, uh, deformation as a result of compression uh, stresses alone. Uh, we know actually the ratio between the enhancement, if you like, from between simple shear of tertiary creep and secondary creep and between um, creep compression alone or extension alone at tertiary creep and secondary creep. So if, if those distances um, between those final strain rates and the minimum, secondary minimum strain rate um, can be called the, um, or, or if we ref if the, the magnitude of the difference is um, an enhancement and we have an enhancement factor here for compression alone, AEC, an enhancement factor here for simple shear alone, ES, then the ratio of ES to EC is well determined as well. So we see that EC is about three eighths of ES. So the Glenn flow relation is really the most commonly used flow relation in large scale ice sheet models. And this is the form that um, we're, I'm going to be looking at today. Um, so we have the strain rate tensor, we have a temperature dependent flow parameter, and it's um, usually um, involves an Arrhenius law with an associated activation energy. Then, um, and A also implicitly captures a broad range of different properties or processes, including the um, effect of impurities in chemistry, um, and, and typically they're not explicitly resolved. And then the effective stress tor E, um, where N is the flow, Glenn flow exponent, and it's one for plastic flow, um, sometimes somewhere between three and four. Perhaps, perhaps there's more in, uh, evidence to indicate it's close to four um, for viscous deformation. And then, oh, I'm missing a little bit, but the sigma term is the deviatoric stress tensor. So that's the difference between the stress tensor and the hydrostatic pressure. So the Glenn flow relation is derived from experiments that were conducted to secondary minimum creep alone. And that turns out that Glenn by construct um, doesn't capture the relationship between uh, the stress and strain rates in the tertiary creep phase, which um, as I mentioned before, was the predominant mode of deformation in ice sheets and glaciers. The Glenn flow relation also because it's only, um, it, because it's based on experiments conducted to secondary minimum creep, um, it, uh, the ice is isotropic in these experiments with no preferred crystallographic orientation. So the Glenn flow relation doesn't account for the, the, the impact of different types of stresses acting on the sample of ice and how they modify the crystal orientation fabric. And one way that um, uh, models sometimes compensate for this is by using an enhancement factor, E of G, which is essentially um, like a tuning factor and it, and it doesn't usually have any physical basis. So so the Glenn flow relation doesn't capture the, the nature of the applied stresses on deformation and, and the impact of anisotropy, which we know are really, really important. Um, and that was really a key motivation for the development of the E-star flow relation. So come in E-star. So this is E-star here. E, um, and you can see that the form of this flow relation is similar to the form of the Glenn flow relation, but the difference really is in this um, term here, E of lambda S. Um, which I'll explain in just a second. So E star stands for empirical scalar tertiary anisotropy regime. And the empirical there comes from the fact that E star has really been derived from decades worth of laboratory experiments of ice deformation um, uh, to tertiary creep under different combinations of simple shear and compression. And that's summarized in the Bud et al paper that I, um, I've got here. And the S stands for scalar. So Bud et al found that um, a scalar flow relation was a really great fit for the 
laboratory experiments and scale really means that there's a collinear rela um, relationship between the strain rate and the, the deviatoric stresses and um, that, that one that includes the effective stress and then some other term um, E of lambda S which determines the fraction of, of deformation that can be um, put down to simple shear alone. Now it's good news that it's scalar because it also simplifies its implementation in ice sheet models, um, which currently use the Glenn flow relation. <clears throat> and it means that it's computationally very tractable as well at the large scale. The T there stands for tertiary. So E star assumes that tertiary creep is the predominant mechanism in ice sheets and glaciers. And then the A for anisotropy. So um, in tertiary creep, we know that the strain rates depend on the nature of the applied stresses and as I outlined earlier, if the, the timescales over which the crystal fabrics develop is short compared with the timescales that the ice would encounter change in the stress configuration, then we can assume, assume that the fabric is compatible with the underlying stress configuration. So ESTAR doesn't explicitly model crystal orientation fabric evolution, um, but it um, parameterizes it through um, nature of the stress configuration. And it's through the shear fraction lambda s which accounts for the um uh, which it really says how much simple shear um is going on so uh, e of lambda s here is equal to e of c plus e s minus ec times lambda s squared where ec is that compression enhancement factor in the figure that i showed earlier so the difference between the tertiary strain rates um, for compression alone experiments compared with the secondary minimum group rate and s is that difference between the um, tertiary strain rates at um, for simple shear alone experiments lambda s here is a um, uh, what we call the shear fraction and it takes values between zero and one so if lambda s is zero then there's no simple shear um, and then we'd see that E of lambda S is only equal to E of C. And if lambda S is equal to one, then we're in a, a, a simple shear alone stress configuration. And then E of lambda S would be equal to E of, e of S. So that's a very handy way of parameterizing um, an isotropy. So E star has been validated um, over a long period. So yeah, I mentioned that it's really a result of, of decades worth of laboratory experiments, which are summarized in that bud paper. Um, it's also um, uh, been uh, tested against um, measurements from a borehole at the Law Dome South um, Summit, Law Dome Summit South um, borehole, along with a bunch of other flow relations. So um, that's represented here in these figures by Trevor et al. So basically, um, uh, this. This paper compares how E star captures stresses um, given a measured strain um, and uh, with a, a bunch of other flow relations. And what the paper finds is that E star generates stress profiles that are most consistent with laboratory observations of tertiary creep in combined uh, stress configurations compared with the other flow relations. But the next step is really looking at how E star captures deformation. And so uh, we implement did it in the ice sheet and sea level system model um, and uh, tested it against a, 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 like over a bunch of idealized uh, domains, including an embayed ice shelf, which um, I'm just going to quickly present the results of here. So um, this is the initial setup here. It's super simple. We've got ice flow direction um, coming out of the page and the ice shelf goes from about 1,000 metres at the inflow boundary to 300 at the ice ocean front. Um, we also look at shear enhancement of eight for, for the um, ESA flow relation and an um, enhancement factor for compression of, of three. And then we set an um, arbitrary um, enhancement factor for the Glenn flow relation to be equal to eight. So that's equal to the shear, simple shear alone enhancement factor in ESA. And it turns out that there are quite considerable difference, differences between the way that the ESA and the Glenn flow relation um, uh, captures ice flow and, and um, how they model the, um, the deformation of the ice shelf at steady state. So here we're just looking at a horizontal slice through that ice shelf and the flow is the flow direction is um, upwards. And I've plotted here the ratio of the surface speeds, um, E star 
divided by GLEM on the left and the, the ratio of the thicknesses of the ice shelf at um, steady state E star divided by GLEM. And what we see is that at steady state, the E star velocities are about 20% slower than the GLEM flow relation velocities at the ice ocean front for a shelf um, that is also about 20% thicker for the E star flow relation. So E star flow relation is, um, is um, leading to slower, slower flow and thicker ice in the Glen flow relation. And so if we think about why that could be the case, um, the differences is really related to the, the um, anisotropy and tertiary creep, which I mentioned before. So here I'm plotting lambda s, and again, um, that's the shear fraction. So if, it, if it's equal to one, then we're in a simple shear alone um, configuration. And if it's equal to zero, then we're in a compression alone configuration. And so we're in an obeyed ice shelf here, and we see that um, lambda s is, is close to one and close to the side walls, but then it decreases um, and in, in the center of the ice shelf, we're in a kind of um, extensional flow. So lambda s is close to zero. E of lambda s um, then naturally will be eight, where we're in simple shear alone configuration and close to three in simple in, um, compression or extension alone. But if we think about um, how that compares to the Glenn flow relation, where we set the enhancement factor for Glenn equal to eight, then we can see quite a different picture of um, enhancement in the E star flow relation compared to Glenn, where the E star flow relation really captures the effects of these different stresses on overall flow. And that's why we see that the E star flow relation um, is, is flowing a lot more slowly in the um, ice shelf than what the Glenn flow relation is. Now, the implications of this finding is that using E star might bring about quite markedly different results of ice shelf evolution <coughs> in realistic domains. And that's the subject of um, current index investigation. And we also expect that this is going to have um, an impact on paleo simulations, for example, of ice sheet growth and decline. So the next step, <coughs> so the next step was um, uh, looking at how E star performs on a, um, over a realistic domain and, and we applied it to Thwaites Glacier. And um, I'm going to talk about this, these modelling uh, results for the rest of the talk now. So this is the modelling domain that we, we looked at. Again, we're using the ice sheet and sea level system model ISSM. And what we wanted to ask was how does the flow regime as represented by the, the Glen flow relation and the E star flow relation impact the um, the, the way that deformation is, is simulated in the model. Um, and one of the, que the key questions that we were asking is um, how do the relative contributions of sliding and deformation to the overall flow differ between these two flow relations and why? So we were looking at the diagnostics or stress, stress balance model um, and we used inverse model uh, methods to estimate the basal friction coefficient. So we know that um, uh, when we're using inverse methods that we're going to we're going to get the same surface modeled surface speeds for both of the flow relations um, but the reasons why those surface speeds might differ is really down to how the model treats um, deformation processes and so <clears throat> i'll run through it now so basically um, this is a similar plot to what i showed you for the ice shelf of of lambda s um, but for E star. So um, oh, actually one thing as well is that we, we chose <coughs> a value of the shear enhancement factor of five and then the compression enhancement factor is um, three eighths of the shear enhancement factor as we know based on the ratio of those two from laboratory experiments. Um, <coughs> so here this is um, uh, the shear fraction and uh, at the base and at the surface and it's close to one for large parts of the domain and actually on the previous slide i kind of we had we had three different um or four different regimes um which we'll come to in just a second but the interior so this orange contour here is the um the contour of the 50 meter per year surface speed and so um in the interior or, or interior or kind of like southwards of that contour we have what's called, we call the bed deformation zone. So this is a region of very, very slow flowing ice where um, our model simulates that the ice is close to being frozen to the bed. 
Um, then we have a sliding zone. So the ice begins to slide really from about the 50 metre per year contour. Um, and then it starts to speed up as you head kind of north of the 76 degree south parallel into what we call the deformation sliding zone. And then the ice shelf is delineated by this um, black contour and we have the Thwaites Glacier Tongue here, which is that really fast flowing portion of the ice shelf. And so we expect that we'd see um, deformation in the, in the dead parallel deformation zone. And um, if we look again at this plot of Lambda S, we see that um, Lambda S is predicting kind of bed parallel um, shear deformation, or it, it's predicting simple shear in, in this region. And, you know, that's most likely bed parallel shear deformation. We see that the, the, there are um, regions where we expect kind of compression or extension alone um, stresses through the sliding zone, but there is still a considerable portion of simple shear um, in that area. And then as we move into the faster flowing region, the, the deformation sliding zone, um, again, we see that there's um, uh, large regions of simple shear. So this really indicates that bed parallel simple shear deformation is, or bed, vertical shear deformation is really dominant for most of the domain. However, um, you know, when we look at the ice shelf, <clears throat> we see that we're moving towards a, um, the compression extension regime and the Thwaites Glacier Tongue. We have this shear zone that separates the Glacier Tongue from the eastern portion of the shelf and um, there's very, very high shear. And obviously um, because the ice shelf is um, low, low flow, what's going on at the base is, is essentially the same as what's going on at the surface. Um, and then we have a pinning point in the eastern shelf where we also expect it to be large. Um, a relatively large proportion of simple shear to the overall um, flow. If we look at the surface, then again we have um, we have large or kind of regions where this simple shear is dominating, and they're typically in um, in the um, margins. And um, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I'm, yeah, they're typically in the margins. So where we we um, where we have um, interaction with again like topography or oh, well not topography because it's, it's this is essentially the um, lateral lateral drag here not um, the parallel shear deformation so the shear margins of the, of the ice sheet there okay so so we have a bit of a picture of where we expect there to be simple shear deformations and where we expect there to be compression or extension deformations and then the next thing that we wanted to look at is um, how much deformation do each of the flow relations predict? Now, I'm presenting the comparison between the Eastoff flow relation here and then the Glen flow relation that is unenhanced. Um, if we enhance the Glen flow relation such that the, um, the enhancement factor for the Glen flow relation is equal to the, the uh, enhancement factor for simple shear in the Eastar flow relation, then we'd expect to see a much more similar picture to the Eastoff flow relation for that for that um, simulation. And we, we in the paper, we, we um, present those results as well. We present a, a, a results of a range of different enhancement factors for the Glen flow relation. What we find is that no single enhancement factor for the Glen flow relation is able to capture the complexity of flow, the differences between the effects of um, simple shear and compression. And um, so in some way, I'm, I'm being a bit cheeky by presenting the results that are most marked, but I'm doing that to highlight the, the impact of um, the different ways that these two flow relations treat um, the, the tertiary creep and anisotropy. And so this plot here is the deformation speed fraction. So basically, we, we, we say that the surface speed is equal to um, some speed that's associated with sliding and some that is associated with deformation. And then we plot the, the fraction, so that between deformation and the overall surface speed, so V def divided by V surf. And where um, the deformation speed fraction is equal to one, then the surface speed is entirely due to deformation. And where deformation speed fraction is equal to zero, then the, the surface speed is entirely um, can be accounted for by a sliding. And so we see um, these three distinct regimes in the E-star flow relation. Firstly, where the ice flow is less than 50 metres per year, 
again, there's a, there's a grey contour here that you can somewhat see, but the shape of the, the differences um, really highlights that contour as well. And upstream of that, we see that the deformation is by far the dominant um, contributor to ice flow. Um, as we move into the um, or past downstream of the 50 meter per year contour, we see that sliding is a dominant, um, the dominant mechanism contributing to overall surface speeds. And that's common in both the East Island and Glen flow relation. And then as we move into a region of faster flow, the deformation sliding zone, which is north of this 76 um, degree south um, parallel, we see that there's both deformation and sliding. And in fact, with the east star flow relation, we see isolated regions where the deformation velocities are upwards of kind of 40, like explain about 40% or, or upwards of 40% of the overall surface speed. But we don't see as much deformation in the Glen flow relation. And in fact, if we look at that um, interior of the basin, where our model predicts that the ice is frozen to the bed, then Glenn's, Glenn actually shows um, unphysical sliding in these regions. And, um, but overall, um, much less deformation. So the East Star, uh, the East Star flow relation simulates um, about 60, 56% more deformation than the Glenn flow relation. Sorry, 58% of them. So, why, and, and you can also see that, um, again, in the um, sliding, in the deformation sliding zone, in that flask flowing zone, the, the Glen flow relation predicts that the flow is almost entirely by sliding alone and that there's very little deformation. So why is this the case? Well, on um, grounded ice, and, and even though the basal shear stress magnitudes are similar, and we know they should be because we're, we're looking at flow under a common driving stress, the magnitude of the deformational velocities um, is a function of the, the magnitude of enhancement for simple shear. And for the Glenn flow relation case where we have no enhancement, um, it just can't capture that bed parallel um, uh, vertical shear profile that we know um, is operating in, in these regions where we have high amounts of deformation. So these plots here, um, show the actual deformation speeds and then the corresponding basal shear stresses. And so the basal shear stresses are similar for the two, but we see for E star that we're getting a lot more deformation um, in, in the interior and in that deformation sliding zone as, as we um, expected from the previous slide. So what we, what we say then is that the E star flow relation by accounting for tertiary creep and the impact of different stress configurations um, on the strain rates through that lambda s parameter, it can, the E star flow relation can, can, um, can predict um, significantly greater vertical shear than what the Glenn flow relation with no enhancement can. And as I mentioned as well, if we enhance the Glenn flow relation to match um, e, the um, simple, shear can, um, simple shear enhancement factor in E star, then we do see that the Glenn flow relation can capture what's going on in the deformation zone a lot better as well as what's going on in the deformation sliding zone, um, but not necessarily for the right reasons. And, and it certainly is not the case that it's um, simulating um, what's happening across the whole domain um, correctly if it's enhanced only for the simple shear enhancement factor. And that's because there are other regions in the domain where we expect um, compression or extension to dominate. And we'll see that as we look at the ice shelf results as well. It's also interesting to note here that the basal shear stresses are of similar magnitude, obviously, but they're not the same. So the, um, in the Glenn flow relation, the, the basal shear stresses, um, the, the maxima are, are larger than the maxima in the East star flow relation and the minima are um, smaller in the Glenn flow relation than the East star flow relation. So the Glenn flow relation essentially is simulating more kind of peaky basal shear stresses and um, and we'll come to that why in just a second. So the magnitude of the basal shear stress extrema is related to um, what's going on in momentum balance. And so in the Glenn flow relation, the ice is a lot stiffer in the upper ice. And so the membrane stresses will play a relatively larger role um, in momentum balance in a Glenn flow relation than in E star. And you can see this, so this is the surface um, viscosity 
uh, Glen minus E star. So you see that the, the Glen viscosity is everywhere greater than the E star fluorilation, particularly in that cold um, uh, bed parallel deformation zone in the interior of the continent. Okay, so for the floating ice shelf, there's no basal friction, obviously. Um, and we also didn't use an inverse approach to kind of calculate um, the flow rate parameter, which would mask the impact of the different um, enhancement factors that we use on the modeled flow. And so the ice shelf results um, for the different flow relations, we could compare directly with the observation. So here on the left here are the observed surface speeds, um, just, just as a um, uh, reference point. And what we find is that over most of the Thwaites Glacier Tongue, so um, the region here, which is west of that shear zone between the Tongue and the Eastern Shelf, um, Eastar provides the best match to observed surface speeds, but the Glen flow relation underestimates the surface speeds. And this is really due to the fact that the Eastar flow relation, again, can account for tertiary creep rates and particularly for the spatial differences um, in enhanced deformation, which, which is associated with that ice anisotropy. So for ESTAR, the average enhancement factor over the Thwaites Glacier Tongue is about 2.54 um, and compared with the Glen Flow results that I'm presenting today, which is for the un, um, unenhanced Glen Flow relation, which is uniformly one across the shelf. And so it makes sense that the Glen Flow relation can't, um, can't uh, match the observed um, flow there. When we have uh, enhancement factor for the Glen flow relation equal to what well, equal to any constant. What we see interestingly over the Thwaites Glacier Tongue is that the magnitude of the simulated flow is um, related to the magnitude of enhancement. So for the Glen flow relation where the, the enhancement factor is constant, um, the degree to which it um, overestimates flow is really related to um, the degree to which the enhancement factor is greater than that average of the, of the E-star enhancement factor over the whole shelf. And so if we pick the a Glen flow relation enhancement factor equal to the simple shear enhancement factor that we used for E-star, then um, we'd, we see that the ice surface speeds for the shelf are much, much larger in the Glen flow relation than what they are in Easter. And if we pick it to, to be equal to the compression alone um, enhancement factor from Easter, then we'd see that the um, speeds are underestimated. Um, so the ice shelf deformation regime ranges from shear driven um, in that shear zone, but, um, between the Thwaites Glacier Tongue and the eastern portion of the shelf. And then we, we also see some shear effects in the transition from the grounded to the floating ice. So, um, so you know, there is the impact of shear on the surface speeds that are modeled by the Easter flow relation, but then we're in a kind of extension, extensional um, regime for most of the ice shelf, as, you, as we can remember from the plot of Lambda S, which I showed, showed earlier. And that means that um, Easter can account for those different um, stress configurations in, in modeling the surface flow. Um, we also know obviously that there are other processes that are not included in the East Star flow relation. So things like rifting or damage um, can, can, also can also be incredibly important in the flow re regime of the Thwaites Glacier Tongue and um, East Star doesn't capture those. And so it's possible that in some regions of the Thwaites Glacier Tongue, East Star is predicting um, softening partly for the wrong reasons. Now, over the eastern portion of the shelf, all of the flow relations overestimate the surface speeds and the degree to which they overestimate the surface speeds is um, uh, um, a function of the enhancement factor. So for the Glen flow relation here, where we, we had no enhancement, um, the simulated surface speeds were most similar to the observed surface speeds um, and then that increased um, for the East Star flow relation and also for the Glen flow relation if we introduce an enhancement factor. Um, and this might be because um, our model actually simulates a mechanical linkage between the Eastern Shelf and the Thwaites Glacier Tongue, which in reality might not be operating um, because we know that that's a region of really extensive crevassing. Um, and we also know that the assumption of the, the deformation that's carried by the East Star or Glen flow relations in, in that zone um, might be inapplicable. Um, because there are 
kind of non-rheological effects that, that influence the flow, such as damage, and are not incorporated in our flow relations that we're using here. So it might be worthwhile, um, I guess, as an extension of further work to look at how um, introducing those effects into Easter. So one other thing that we had a look at is the differences between um, the simulated and observed surface speeds using different flow rate parameterizations for that, that parameter A, T. And so we used a Bud Jacker um, parameterization, the parameterization from Patterson and a parameterization from the Cuffey and Patterson textbooks as well. And um, what we find is that actually there's a really big difference between the impacts of these different flow rate parameterizations. Um, so again, I've got the difference here between simulated and observed surface speeds over the ice shelf for those different flow relations. And um, the Bud Jacker relation in general simulates the best fit to the observed shelf surface speeds. Um, sorry, that's the black one. Yeah. Um, and generally across the domain. So in the interior of the catchment, the Bud Jacker um, flow relation kind of best um, approximates surface speeds. Um, in the, the region where deformation dominates, that bare deformation zone. But the Cuffey Patterson and Patterson flow relations actually lead to an overestimate of the um, surface speed. So, so something was going on in the inversion in those cases, and, and um, we, we couldn't actually get uh, sufficiently low um, surface flow from those. Um, they, they, there was more deformation in both of those flow um, rate parameters than. Um, in the observations. And in fact, the differences um, between these different flow rate parameterizations can sometimes be larger than the differences between the E star and the Glenn modeled and surfaced. Um, sorry, the differences between the E star and the Glenn um, surface speeds in the interior of the catchment. Um, and this suggests that the, there's, it's really important to consider how we look at this flow rate parameter um, A. Um, as its specification can sometimes be, or well, the impact of its specification can sometimes be as great as the impact of an isotropy or including or ignoring an isotropy or tertiary creep in the flow relation. Now, there are a couple of assumptions underlying the E-star flow relation I talked about earlier. So first of all, we assume that tertiary creep is the predominant mode of deformation. And we also assume that the crystal orientation fabrics um, are compatible with the underlying stress configuration at, at steady state. But there's going to be zones where these assumptions don't apply. And um, we expect that they'll be somewhat restricted in extent. So there's work by Tors Nimson um, et al. in 2003. But we, we do know that um, there are regions within the ice sheet where the fabric has a, um, hasn't evolved to be compatible with the flow, um, where we see that there's kind of rapid transi transitions in the flow configuration or where um, or where deformation makes only a minor contribute, contribution to the overall flow, where we, we might expect to see that the e -star, the assumptions underlying E-star um, make it not applicable to those regions. And so we wanted to have a little bit of a look at that. And what we did is we, um, we um, calculated the deformation length scale. So that's the distance. Um, it's represented as the distance following an abrupt stress configuration that's required to reach to re-establish compatibility. So it's a function of the accumulated strain. And we calculate at which we set as 10%, um, which is a, a relatively conservative estimate. So we calculated this deformation length scale and, and I'm plotting it here for the base and for the surface. And what we see um, is that it's generally small in the base, particularly in the deformation zone. We see that it increases in regions where there are transitions to um, or variable basal shear stresses um, uh, and where the basal shear stresses almost vanish um, uh, we see very very large deformation length scales but in these regions um, deformation might not be hugely important for the dynamics and we also see that um, it that compatibility is, is relatively quickly restored once you transition past these zones um, the the deformation length scales are largest in the sliding zone um, but then we also know in this sliding zone that the, the shear fraction is relatively low and, and doesn't vary a lot. And so um, these long compatibility scales are really only significant where the, the shear fraction varies a lot along the flow. So, so we, again, we kind of say that this region, um, the assumptions of compatibility, even though that they might not be 
robust, um, that we don't expect that that's going to actually matter too much for the dynamics. Um, and generally where we do see um, incompatibility crop up, um, we generally see that it's, it's relatively quickly restored. Um, and so this indicates that the assumptions underlying Easter are not too concerning, particularly when you compare them with the assumptions underlying the Glen flow relation um, that doesn't uh, incorporate tertiary creep or anisotropy. So, so that's um, basically it for the for the modelling. I just wanted to spend a um, couple of slides talking about future directions. And obviously, one of the big things is um, how we constrain parameters in flow relations. Um, and if we think about these ES and EC parameters for um, simple shear and compression in the E star flow relations. Um, how do we actually choose appropriate values for those? Um, and, uh, and similarly for other parameters in the flow relation, so the value for N in different, um, in different uh, defam deformation mechanism, re regions of different deformation mechanism, um, and the, the prefactor in the flow rate parameter A as well. And so there was a recent paper that looked at satellite observations um, to, um, to calculate um, or to calibrate N on ice shelves. And, and one question is, can we use a similar approach or can we, or how can we use observations more broadly to constrain um, not just the parameters in ESTAR, but the processes that it represents. And so that's definitely a work in, in progress. And I guess, um, you know, these studies sometimes bring up more questions than answers. And, and so these are some of the, the questions that I've been thinking about. So are our current flow relations um, that we use in continental scale modelling capable of capturing the process that, processes that we need them to capture? Um, do they do what we need them to do? And, and how do we actually ensure that they are doing what we need them to do in the absence of um, observations to the base for most of the ice sheet? And then the temperature dependent nature of deformation, how do we better capture this? So our results suggested that that was as important as the um, effect of tertiary creep in anisotropy in some regions. And, um, and what about where there's temperate ice? So our flow relations don't, um, don't in, uh, do a good job of capturing the impact of temperate ice on deformation. And that's a really important thing to consider. Then what happens as the climate warms and, and how do these um, deformation regimes play out in Easter and, and Glen in, in different climates? Um, so yeah, these I guess uh, uh, future directions and, and things that we're actively thinking about and working on now. And um, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Felicity. Um, so what we usually do with questions is we ask people to indicate in the chat if they've got a question at all, um, and then um, get people to unmute, um, and then ask the question themselves. Do we, uh, Frank, do you want to unmute yourself? It's going to work. Do you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks a lot, Felicity, for this wonderful talk. I hope we meet up in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it was about, I, I'm interested in those shell velocities of Twaits, where mm -hmm. you showed that Glenn's flow law is underestimating the velocities. Mm -hmm. And I would think that, I mean, my, my, my gut feeling is that it would be the other way around. That's why people put in some yeah, enhancement factor. No, uh, I mean, increase the viscosity of ice shelves. So, or probably I completely misunderstood it. So, I, so my gut feeling was that Glenn's flow law would underestimate the velocities. So E-star is, 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 is doing a much better job. And I was wondering why it was. Yeah, so you're right. For the Thwaites Glacier Tongue, the Glen flow relation does underestimate the velocities. And that's because, um, so for the E star flow relation, we see that the enhancement factor across the Thwaites Glacier Tongue is about equal to 2.5. For the Glen flow relation results that I showed you, it's unenhanced. So, so, um, so it, it doesn't capture the impact of. Um, either simple shear or compression um, in, in flow. So it's a lot stiffer and it flows a lot slower. So yes, we, we do in, introduce enhancement factors into the Glen flow relation um, to kind of account for that usually. And um, 
we tested a bunch of different enhancement factors for the gland flow relation. And if the enhancement factor for the gland flow relation is less than the, the average of the E-star flow relation, then the gland flow relation will um, underestimate the flow. And if the enhancement factor is larger, then it will overestimate the flow. But one thing that we, and so, you know, you can tune your model by, by tuning the enhancement factor such that you get a, a good match. For our case, we decided to only look at uniform enhancement factors for the gland flow relation so that we could actually explore what's going on in the dynamics. But, but we can tune those parameters um, in the gland flow relation to get a better match. However, they're not going to allow us to, um, to capture the changes in flow as the dynamics change. And so we expect to see changes in the stress configuration um, in response to different climate forcings. And if we set the Glen flow relation to be um, to have a constant enhancement factor, that's not going to um, that's not going to evolve as the stress configuration evolves. So we'd expect to see that that could actually introduce artifacts into the the um, flow that it's that it's estimating. Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Frank, you're muted. Uh, that, no, that is what I saw in your um, idealized experiments, that it's not a uniform yeah. Uh, effect. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. It's uh, a great talk. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Olga, do you want to unmute yourself? Thank you, Felicity. Uh, perhaps I missed what kind of uh, momentum balance have you used in your oh. simulations? That's a very important question, which I didn't address. Um, so I used the higher order approximation for the Th Thwaites simulation. What about the I shelf? Also, yeah, also higher order. Yeah, so it's higher order of the entire domain. And have you looked at the vertical deformation of the I shelf? How did it compare to the deformation, what you call the membrane stresses? What was the ratio? Yeah, no, so on the ice shelf, um, the surface and basal flow were almost identical. And so we didn't see a vertical profile, um, or vertical shear deformation profiles. It was mainly the extensional stresses that are important in the Thwaites Glacier time, mm -hmm. and then we had Actually, How um, do you explain in your E star what you call shear? What is the physical meaning? What, you know, the shear contribution in your E star um, reality? Sorry, how do I? Um, what what so does it actually my mean? My understanding of your proposed theology is that there, is, there are different modes of deformation, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you are saying that there is no vertical uh, shear on the ice shelf, then what is the physical meaning of that contribution in your deform uh, in your rheological relationship? That's my question. Yeah. Yeah. So on the ice shelf, we see um, lateral drag. So the um, that shear zone between the Thwaites Glacier Tongue and the Eastern Shelf, um, we, we simulate a mechanical linkage between those two components of the shelf. And so there's, there's actually sh lateral shear between, between those. So most of the shear, simple shear that's um, on the ice, that's represented on the ice shelf in, in the Lambda S parameter, which I showed earlier, is coming from um, those lateral shear components. Yeah, so Thank Roland you. says that the ice shelf has simple shear in the membrane stresses. So that what I call the hor like the horizontal component, though it's not actually horizontal, but the you know, the okay. shear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Frank also said, is E star implicitly taking into account damage? And and no, it's not. Um, there's that that's one thing that we could consider developing into E star, um, similar relation to the Borstad one, which is in the Glen flow relation, but um, that hasn't been done yet. Um, Daniel, have you got a question? Yeah, um, great talk. 
Uh, I just wanted to ask, and feel free to tell me to just read your paper. Uh, how does this compare to the CAFE flow model or some of the other anisotropic flow models? Um, so I, I don't actually look at the, those other anisotropic flow models mm. in this paper. Um, I guess they're, they are um, examined in the Trevero paper, which I mentioned, um, that oh, okay. compares, yeah, that, so that compares the CAFE model, um, the model by Thorstensen and um, the uh, Agudazuma Ag um, flow model mm -hmm. um, and the Glen, the Glen flow relation as well. And so um, it finds that the, the E star flow relation kind of best matches the what we expect to see in the stresses for the given um, strains. But there actually hasn't been a comparison of all of these flow relations um, over an, a realistic domain that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. which is a really interesting question. Gotcha. Perhaps we need an anisomib. I think you would just volunteer to organize it. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, are there any, is there any last question for Felicity? I see people are having to go out to uh, get to uh, things on the hour. Um, it looks like we've run out of questions for you, Felicity, but uh, a huge thank you again for getting up uh, so early for us. And uh, yeah. Uh, look forward to your arrival in Europe and maybe we can all see you and uh, in person. That would be fantastic. Thanks very much, Tavi. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. And just a reminder that there is no uh, seminar next week, um, but there is one the following week. That's the last one for the summer. Thank you very much for the fantastic presentation, Felicity. Thank you. <laughs>